He's a hybrid technical lead armed with a master's degree in informatics and he primarily specializes in advanced virtual reality and cutting edge HTML5. He's an Emmy winning dual screen Chrome experiment. Um, his, body of, sorry, his body of work includes a mind blowing 3D web experience called Star Wars Lightsaber Escape. An Emmy winning dual screen Chrome experiment, just a reflector. An Adobe Cut Edge award winner Kingsman dual screen experience and Cannes Alliance one show, one show winner Minimaps. Please welcome to the stage Mr. Maciej Zawada. Thanks so much. Hi everyone. How's everyone doing? All good? So let's get it started. So my name is Maciej Zasada. Um, as it was mentioned, I'm a tech lead at Unit 9. And um, also I am the founder of Le Publish Bureau, which is basically Unit 9 uh, technical department uh, in Poland. Um, besides this, I'm also um, an FWA judge and uh, you've got my contact details here. So feel free to reach out after the presentation if you have any more uh, questions than you can ask um, today. Um, so a couple words um, in terms of like, you know, my background. Um, so I come from Unit 9. Unit 9 is a uh, multidisciplinary um, digital production company. So we do lots of uh, different things. I currently ranked um, second in, um, in the world's um, ranking. Um, in terms of like my body of work, like, you know, some of them were already mentioned, but like just to give you a bit of uh, insight into what kind of brought me to actually making Star Wars Lightsaber Escape is um, um, like, you know, some time ago, it was a couple years ago, um, I was part of uh, my first work for Disney. That was uh, Find Your Way to Oz. Um, it was an HTML5 WebGL experience. Uh, so basically, you know, especially that time, it was like, you know, super cutting edge visuals um, for Disney exactly and for um, their upcoming movie at that time, Oz the Great and Powerful. Um, then another work I uh, was actually lucky to, to be part of was um, Kingsman The Secret Service. That was actually a second screen experience, so you used your phone to like draw various patterns and uh, like, you know, complete mini games uh, throughout the experience that like, you, know, you watched on, on the desktop screen. Um, and um, another thing uh, that I worked on as well was just a reflector, which was mentioned as well, the Emmy winner. And um, like this experience was actually combining pretty much, you know, the, the two other projects. So, like, first of all, it was WebGL um, shaders, uh, lots of cool visual effects on top of um, a music video for um, the Arcade Fire Band. And um, also it was a second screen experience where you used, um, like, gyroscope and uh, we were tracking the position of your phone to actually be able to um, cast various effects on, um, on your desktop screen. Like, just kind of, you know, to, to mind you, because uh, that's a bit of a different um, type of an experience. So that's all web-based. It works in the browser. Or it's HTML5, WebGL. And um, basically, like all this together, uh, you know, kind of put some faith, I guess, in, in myself in the company. So I was given the, the opportunity to um, be the tech lead on um, Star Wars Lightsaber Escape, which we released in uh, December 2015. So quite, quite lately. And um, so this presentation, um, I always like to give context for, like, you know, how you should approach this, um, what you should try to pay attention to, and potentially what not to. So this presentation is aimed to um, inspire you um, with the possibilities of uh, like, you know, games on the web. Um, it's basically, you know, if you do game development, of course, like, you know, Unity is, is super cool, like, you know, consoles, mobile phones and so on, but like web is still a platform which is super successful um, for different types of uh, games. Um, also, yeah, so show you the possibilities. It's like, you know, what's possible nowadays on the web and um, to give it a big picture and um, a bit of insight as well into how we actually built um, Star Wars Lightsaber Escape, uh, but it's not to teach you code. So like, you know, even if you have some code snippets, like feel free to just kind of try to get the big picture, but um, don't try to dive too deep. Um, it's uh, not the aim of the presentation. Um, so actually, like, you know, there are different types of things I'll be mentioning. So a couple of ones are like just, you know, the overview. So not going too much into detail. I'll tell you quickly how we actually worked on this project because there were like many different parties involved. Disney, ILM, Google, 72 and Sunny, which is the agency and um, Unit 9, our company. Um, also the technology we used. So again, kind of like big picture for um, what we used to make this project um, a reality. 
and um, also performance optimization. But then I'll try to also dive a bit deeper into a couple more interesting uh, points, like, for example, uh, the lightsaber control model, like how we actually um, implemented the lightsaber control, how we made it so successful. There's a bit of a funny backstory to it as well. And um, I'll talk quickly about physics and uh, back-end infrastructure as well, giving you some um, ideas of the challenges that we encountered and how we managed to solve them. But before we dive into like, you know, how we built it, let's quickly see what we built. Since 1977, every boy and girl has dreamt of wielding an actual working lightsaber. But it's never been made possible until now. We partnered with Star Wars to create a Chrome experiment that utilized the Polymer framework to create a lightweight HTML5 build that rendered complex, immersive 3D graphics in WebGL in real time, and set up WebSockets connections allowing for accelerometer and gyroscope data transmission between devices all hosted on a flexible and scalable Google App Engine setup resulting in a low latency, high fidelity experience. Basically, we turned your phone into a lightsaber, which you could then use to battle stormtroopers on a second screen and escape the first order. Every move, every push, every tilt, swipe, or jab was matched in real time across the web, all in hopes of escaping faster than any of your friends. No one can defeat a Sith. At a time when Star Wars fandom had reached a fever pitch, Star Wars oranges in the grocery store, people around the world didn't just lose their shit about lightsaber escape. Oh my god, this is turning me on. They reviewed it. Brian, you and I are gonna play lightsaber escape. Recorded it. <laughs> played it together, and then took it to the next level. And developers everywhere got to experience how Google is pushing the limits of what's possible on a web browser. More importantly, the experiment became a big part of mass culture. May the force be with Google users. You too can be a Jedi. It turns your smartphone into a lightsaber. You get to experience what it's like to fight with a lightsaber and what it's like to go to the Apple store after you throw your phone across the room pretending that it was a lightsaber. All resulting in a massive awakening and millions of dreams nearly coming true. Cool. So that was for the guys who um, didn't have a chance to actually try this experience. Um, let's now have a look into how we built it and um, like what was the process. Um, so as I mentioned, um, this project, like you know, was like there were many parties involved: Google, Disney, um, ILM, 72 and Sony, Unit 9. Um, it actually all started with 72 and Sony, which is the digital agency. Um, approaching us, Unit 9, kind of asking, uh, you know, do you guys think it, it would be possible to do like a lightsaber game where you, like your phone becomes the lightsaber? Um, so they had this super cool idea, but like even though we have actually like successfully completed all the other projects, we weren't sure, like absolutely sure if the latency won't be an issue, for example, in, in this kind of a game, because like it requires precision, it requires responsiveness. So it was actually quite tricky. So we said, okay, like, you know, let's answer these questions with a prototype. So we've spent like you know a couple of weeks. That was actually like you know five six weeks developing um, quite a small team. Um, we developed uh, the experience in CoffeeScript using uh, FreeJS for uh, WebGL, and uh, also like you know everything was based on WebSockets. So the connection between your phone and the desktop was uh, achieved with web, with WebSockets, and um, everything was written from scratch. And uh, like you know the result was quite rough around the edges. Like you know bear with me. It was uh, a really quick prototype, but I think it's quite cool to have a look into what we actually did, you know, in those couple of weeks. So, um, actually at that time, we had the impression that the idea of, of the project is going to be uh, a lightsaber duel. It's like fighting against another person with a lightsaber. And, um, like, we were really happy because we managed to achieve that, like, you know, the technical challenge. So, basically, you know, controlling the lightsaber with your phone. Um, and uh, the latency was quite small. Um, it, was, it was actually pretty good. The biggest problem was that we weren't able to stop the user's hand, like, you know, physically in the air, like, while it should, like, you know, clash with the other lightsaber. So, Basically, the user experience was not amazing because, again, like you know, your lightsaber on the screen was like blocked when you hit something, but then in reality, your hand was just like you know following. So um, we just thought, okay, like you know, this this is pretty cool. Maybe it's uh, it's got some disadvantages, but uh, that's still something. And um, actually, we were super happy because the agency fought the same. So it was a win. We won the project, and uh, we started the big production. 
So um, like every project like this usually starts with storyboards. Um, that's to give you a, a bit of an idea. So every aspect of the story was like you know sketched, uh, designed. So that's like you know sliding through the pipe in the beginning of the experience, like you know dropping somewhere in the corridor. Um, so we were going through like you know series of sketches, working with artists, working with like you know concept artists, level designers, um, trying to like you know give a sense to the experience. And uh, like you know, all this was uh, uh, basically you know part of the feedback uh, that we were getting from um, all the parties involved. And um, as you can see, like you know, this whole um, user journey was was shaped pre in, in pretty much like you know high detail. And um, this like you know um, big boss at the very end with this secret weapon. Actually, like we were, when we were working on this project, we weren't able to receive any like motion uh, references for how the light button works at this time. Like it was before the movie was released, so we had to like try to figure out how it actually works and uh, like also uh, try to get some insight, which was really really difficult. So um, that's the storyboards. Um, in in the same time at the same time basically like when working on the storyboards um our artists were working on concept arts so that's like you know defining the style of the experience how everything should look more or less like you know it wasn't like you know 3d render it was more or less like just done by the artists uh giving some like you know shape to your arms to the lightsaber um so all these kind of things uh were were defined at very early stage and uh like once we had this more or less agreed on, um, we started work on uh, 3D design and uh, like, you know, the ILM, uh, which is basically like, you know, the Lucasfilm company, were um, reviewing our work, uh, we were collaborating with them, super helpful guys. Um, so like all our 3D designs were like, you know, going through rounds of feedback, uh, people were like, you know, drawing on them, um, showing how things should actually be positioned, uh, like, you know, even commenting on small stuff like uh, the rust on, um, for example, you know, the, the ventilation shaft, like, you know, which way it should be growing. Um, then, you know, a bit, a bit further in the process, it was uh, lighting, shadows, um, all, all the texturing. Uh, so um, it was quite a long process, but a very, very efficient one and, and really nice collaboration. And um, another part of the process was also the UI and UX design. Um, so all the actual, like, you know, because that's a web experience. So we had to design all the website, um, desktop, uh, mobile application, um, and also the game screens, like, you know, user interface. So lots of, lots of design work uh, but like you know finally once we had this done we could start working on uh, the technology so um, that's also part of the overview so um, that's a project for Google um, we decided to use polymer which is uh, basically like a web framework which um, like you know bases the idea on web components like you know you might not be familiar with web technology so I'll just um, give you a super quick idea um, so when working with uh, like you know polymer the idea is like you you, you import elements um, as like you know just simple HTML files and uh, then you can use them as custom tags in HTML so for example a whole map which is like you know working it's got all the interaction it's all it's got all the styling. It's basically just one custom HTML element. And um, like, you know, this super simple idea was actually very powerful for us because if you develop a web experience, which is not like a standard website, sometimes the frameworks, which like, you know, put some uh, more strict structure on top of uh, your work are sometimes too constraining. So Polymer was the perfect fit for us. Um, we also worked with WebGL and FreeJS. So basically, like you know, WebGL is sort of like you know, um, OpenGL. Uh, you can you can see it this way, uh, slightly slightly kind of less advanced and, and less powerful. Um, and uh, FreeJS is basically like a high level library on top of WebGL. So it lets you work with higher level concepts, like for example, you know, renderers. Um, perspective camera, you know, creating scenes, adding stuff to scenes, um, also uh, setting positions. Basically, like, you know, um, what you would do with, with, you know, Unity, for example, the only thing is it doesn't give you the editor. Like, you know, there is a simple editor, but it's uh, not as powerful as Unity. So, like, usually you do, you do stuff in um, code. And um, if we speak about code, um, we used CoffeeScript, SAS, and uh, J uh, to actually develop all this. To give you um, to give you the big picture, um, 
but in terms of the game engine, so FreeJS gives you just uh, like the graphics design uh, layer. It doesn't give you anything which is related to um, actual game engine. So uh, we actually wrote um, a game engine 100% from scratch. Um, so uh, like you know, taking care of everything, like you know, the update loop. Uh, you know, passing and computing correct, like delta time and time for um, all the frames, rendering everything when it needs to be rendered, basically like, you know, a super custom implementation, everything super low level. Um, but we took some inspiration from Unity. Um, again, you know, it's a great technology. Um, it's, uh, you know, just uh, maybe not, not necessarily uh, the first choice for the web, um, at least for us. But um, we took some inspiration from Unity to design, um, like you know, behaviors. So for us, a behavior was basically like a connection between the FreeJS object and um, a CoffeeScript class. So a logic on top of a 3D object, which is more or less what you have in Unity. Um, so again, like you know, everything written from scratch, everything super custom. But one thing which is pretty pretty interesting, it might be hard to see it actually here, but I'll just um, give you a quick idea. So we had those like you know big configurations. Like normally in Unity, you could set parameters in the editor. Like you know, you've you've got those public variables, and you can set um, like you know the values in in the editor. Because we don't have the editor, we had to come up with something custom. So we had those like you know big configurations uh, for every single object. So like like that's, for example, the tutorial Stormtrooper, and uh, we could define everything from like um, what animations it is allowed to play when it falls, so like an array of fall animations, uh, what animations it is allowed to play for like shooting, because like this tutorial Stormtrooper had um, a very specific style of shooting. Um, also things like um, the shooting rates, so like how fast he shoots at you, um, the energy of that given Stormtrooper, uh, like what damage um, a, a uh, like you know a light shot which is deflected towards that stormtrooper causes. Uh, even things like, for example, uh, cover rate. So cover rate for us was like how often can this given stormtrooper take cover between uh, behind an obstacle. So for the tutorial stormtrooper that was set to zero because we didn't want this guy to, to actually take cover. It was just a tutorial. Um, so everything was like, you know, super flexible, super configurable. And uh, like this is something I think, you know, which is which is really worth mentioning is we've spent quite some time developing this engine um, specifically for this project. Uh, I think, you know, it could have been like, you know, two weeks of, of development, but then it saved us so much work um, that it's really, really always good to have a, a solid foundation for your project. Um, another thing is we were working with um, timeline events. So basically uh, for the player transform, uh, we had like, you know, timestamps so in, in seconds and uh, events that were supposed to be triggered. That was a very easy thing to then uh, like you know link other events to to be like you know connected with the player's position within the experience um so that's how we built the engine but like i think you know one of the most important things about this project is uh the actual lightsaber control um and um so before we started this project, we already had some code from uh just a reflector and um kingsman um and uh to be honest i mean you know I'm not sure if you ever investigated like what the possibilities are of using gyroscope and accelerometer of your phone, but just to give you a super simple idea, it's like if if the gyroscope makes an error of like half a degree uh, in measurement, you would get like uh, if if you tried to compute the position of your phone just using like you know acceleration and orientation because technically that should be possible, right? Like, you know, in theory. But if the measurement is like you know off by half a degree, you would get an error of like 10 meters per second. So that's just like, you know, completely uh, useless. However, um, working on uh, just a reflector, uh, we developed an algorithm which was actually pretty, pretty accurate. So what you can see here is all based on just accelerometer and gyroscope, and that was estimating the phone's position with regards to the screen um, in 3D space, uh, regardless of the phone's orientation. Um, but the only way we managed to achieve this was to always assume that the phone returns to like the zero position after a while. So it, it didn't let you like hold the phone at a specific position for a long, long period of time. It was just for like rapid motions, drawing 3D shapes in the air. Um, but even though it was so, I would, I would say accurate, even based on this video, it was definitely not accurate for us to, to work with uh, 
uh, like you know a super super reliable uh, lightsaber uh, control. So um, this code. Yeah, had this constraint of uh, 3D position. And um, our first approach um, when developing the lightsaber control with, with this specific model um, was to place the pivot point of, uh, of the lightsaber. So basically, like, you know, the origin which is controlled by the gyroscope and accelerometer da data in the hilt, in the lightsaber hilt. That seemed like, you know, pretty, pretty logical, right? So you hold the lightsaber, you know, this is the point where you control it. And um, the result was like, it looked okay. Um, so you could control the lightsaber, you could uh, like, you know, turn it any way you, you pretty much wanted. And um, you were even able to slightly control like, you know, the offset. So the lightsaber could move like, you know, left and right based on your hands position. But during user testing, what we figured out is that actually something is broken here because people don't want to block like this. They try to block like that. And because we don't have the position remaining like, you know, fixed for a longer period of time, you can actually hold the lightsaber up in the air. Like if you do this, the lightsaber would be like that. Because it always stays in the center, like in, the, in its origin, in the pivot point. So that was the problem. And we didn't really know at the beginning how to solve it. But then we came up with something uh, pretty interesting just by watching this video and like other video, uh, videos of people actually trying the experience. So the pivot point of a lightsaber in a, in a lightsaber game is not really the lightsaber itself. It's not really the, not really the hilt. It's your chest. When you, when you wield, wield the lightsaber with two hands, it's like what you move is actually like, you know, when you block, when you do all those kind of motion, this is your pivot point. This is what should rotate. So we changed the approach and um, we basically moved the pivot point to, to like, you know, this area more or less. So that's like the extension of arms. And um, the results were absolutely amazing. That simple tweak, not changing anything to the gyroscope uh, accuracy, um, already gave us an amazing result. And uh, have a look at this video. It's made by one of our players. Um, and uh, like the image is mirrored uh, between the camera and, and the gameplay. But I guess you can see how accurate uh, the tracking is and uh, how accurate the motion is. So that was pretty accurate and to be honest that video even surprised us because we never tried it with an actual lightsaber but uh, it was it was pretty stunning and uh, again like all just by placing the pivot point here so even if you wanted to block technically like you know the motion of your phone was just this but because the pivot point was here the whole arms were like you know moving up and uh, the lightsaber was uh, blocking um, blocking, uh, you know, the light shots. Um, cool. A couple of words about physics and the challenges that we had here. So again, like, you know, that's pretty much everything that we've done, written from scratch. Um, single clock, that's something you know from Unity as well, so you can control the, like, global time for the whole experience. So here you have an example, like, you know, how easily we could control um, and, like, change everything to slow motion, for example, or even completely stop the time. So everything would stop, like, you know, the lightsaber was only, like, unrelated because it's, like, controlled by the user. Um, so that's something, I guess, uh, pretty familiar from you. Um, we had to write it from scratch. And uh, then something which is, like, you know, on the, on the, on the margin between physics and uh, performance optimization, so collision detection. Um, that's actually one of my favorite parts of, of the project because it's, uh, like, you know, so simple in the end. So when we approached this, we had this problem. Okay, so we want to detect the collisions between uh, the laser shot and the stormtrooper, like when, when the laser is deflected. So what is the laser, what is the stormtrooper? Like technically they are meshes, right? So you've got lots of vertices, you know, uh, both here and there. And um, the approaches you find online all are the same. They, they are good because they work in most cases or like, you know, most of the times you actually need them. So you iterate over like all the vertices uh, in tree and then like you raycast from every single vertex and um, then you try to see if, if the actual like two meshes overlap in a way. But 
that's going to be super super slow. Like you know, we, you saw we've got so many um, so many light shots actually flying in the air. Like every single moment of the experience, we've got like you know 10, 15 stormtroopers every single time. So it's just you know it would end up being super slow. So. We thought, like, you know, how about actually if we simplify the whole concept of this collision to, well, you know, that's not surprising, I guess. So it's like uh, the stormtrooper just becomes uh, a box. I mean, you know, that's something pretty simple. But uh, the laser itself, how about if it becomes just a vector? So it's got its origin and it's got the direction and it's got a length. That's pretty much it. So then we can um, have super simple collision detection by doing a single raycast. So you raycast from the origin of, uh, of the laser towards the storm, like, you know, towards the direction um, of, of the laser itself. And um, you measure the, the distance to the collision. So that's, you know, this, uh, this thing here. And uh, then you compare it to the, to the length of the actual laser. So in this case, it's um, obvious that there is no collision be because the, like, the, the length of the laser itself is shorter than the uh, distance to, to the collision. In other words, like, you know, if you have it like this, uh, the distance is shorter, there is a collision. So that was pretty cool and uh, we were pretty happy with it, but we said, okay, actually that's going to be quite problematic with one thing. You, I guess you know if you develop a game which is like you know super um, super like you know fast moving objects, uh, you usually have this issue with collision, collision detection that sometimes the object can just like you know fly, fly through surfaces, and um, like you normally so yeah so this is more or less the situation. So you've got like you know one frame, uh, the laser is here, then another frame because the frame rate is low or just simply because the laser is moving so fast, uh, the laser is already here. So it means like you know no collision, right? But we know the collision actually should have happened. So what do we do? Like the normal, again, the normal approach would be to use, I guess, continuous um, collision simulation. So like in a nutshell, if you're, if you're not familiar with this topic, it's like um, knowing the speed of the bullet um, and um, you basically know the time remaining to the collision. Uh, because you know the speed, you know the distance, so you know when the collision actually should happen. Um, and if the next frame of your like you know rendering cycle is after that period of time, then you assume the collision must have occurred. But what about if you have, you know, that's your first frame, and that's the next frame? So, for example, the stormtrooper crouched. Did the collision occur or not? I mean, you know, for me, it didn't potentially, like possibly it didn't. So um, like this solution didn't really work. So we had to come up with something custom and uh, this is the ultimate idea we had. So um, first frame, we raycast again, you know, the standard way and we see that there is a collision in the future. In the next frame, we see that there is no collision, but we know there was a collision in the past. So what we do instead is now we raycast backwards and uh, in this case, we see that there was a collision in the past. So if there was a collision in the future and the next frame, there was a collision in the past and there was like nothing in between, we know that the collision must have happened. And also it solves the problem when, when the stormtrooper crouches. Um, so you've got, you know, in the first frame, a uh, collision in the future, and the next frame, there was no collision in the past, so we can consider the collision didn't happen. And um, in, in the most kind of, you know, worst scenario case in this, in, in this moment, um, you only do three raycasts, uh, two forwards and like one backwards uh, per laser. So uh, that was pretty efficient and, uh, and it actually uh, saved a lot of our performance. Um, Another thing which is uh, like a big aspect of, um, of most games, like, you know, if you do multiplayer games, uh, this one was actually not multiplayer, but in a sense, like, you know, you connect your phone to the computer, um, is the backend infrastructure. And if you do a project, uh, like, you know, either, either a big game release or if you, if you do a project for Star Wars, you can actually expect millions of people playing this over a very short period of time. So just to give a big, like, you know, a quick overview of how we and what we did on, on the backend side. So we used the Google Cloud Platform, which, like, you know, has a couple really interesting projects. The two most important ones, at least for us, were Google App Engine, which is like a general kind of hosting solution, and Google Compute Engine, which is like virtual machines uh, up in a cloud. Um, so the architecture of our system was actually 
uh, it wasn't maybe super complex, but just to give you an overview of like the key components. So we had like you know device one, device two. So they tr tried to connect. We had Google App Engine running a RESTful API. Then we had a uh, Google Cloud Data Store, uh, which was yeah, it's like you know you can consider this a database. Um, and uh, we had the whole Google Compute Engine infrastructure. So it was behind a cross-region load load balancer. So basically, like you know, if you try to connect, it would point you to the closest server uh, based on your geo location and uh, then you have like you know instance groups so each location has like each machine actually is like one instance group um, sorry each location is like one instance group and then you have uh, individual machines in those groups so it's actually pretty pretty um, like you know layered in a way and then you have ultimately the, the WebSocket servers running on each virtual machine um, within the cluster um, so th that's the architecture, and like we really wanted to use as many ready products as possible because, like you know, we just had like this project. This whole project was developed in three months, uh, so it was not a lot of time, and uh, we really didn't want to have uh, have to develop a custom load balancer. Uh, so we really wanted to use the one which is already built in um, to the Google platform. So we faced a really uh, basic issue, but uh, like, you know, one that uh, took some time to actually solve was uh, load balancing versus pairing the devices. So we've got those two devices, right? So we've got the computer and we've got uh, the mobile phone, uh, the two clients. And uh, the nature of WebSockets is that if you really want to use the whole potential and performance of WebSockets, and again, for us, latency was absolutely essential to bring it as low as possible. Um, you have to have both clients on the same machine. So the communication is done um, in memory and you don't have to use any like, you know, additional sockets or any, you know, signaling channels which would work over like internet, even on local host. Um, so that's the, like, you know, that's the best solution we wanted to, um, to achieve. But the problem with this solution is that if you have the load balancer, you've got the situation like that. So you've got client one, they try to connect, they go through the load balancer, they land on some random machine, then you've got a client too, which goes through the load balancer, and they land on a different machine. And uh, that was the problem. So um, the solution actually, you know, as most solutions, appears to be quite simple, but it took some time to figure it out. So um, the idea we've had was to, like, in addition to the load balancer, to add an API and a database. So these are the two components we had to add to the system to make everything work. So both, like, use the, the ready-made load balancer, which we couldn't modify, and um, also to, to be able to have both devices on the same machine. So when a client one was connecting, they didn't have the connection code. They would go through the API. The API would then go through the load balancer, would land on like, you know, a random machine as we already know. But that machine would go back through the API and would save in the database its external IP address and the generated connection code. So the connection code was then returned to the client, and uh, like you know, so you could see the connection code on the desktop screen. You would type it on your mobile phone. So then, when the mobile phone connects, they go through the API. The API queries uh, the IP address of the machine uh, via the connection code that we already know, and uh, the IP address is returned to the client. And the second client completely bypasses the load balancer and just goes straight to um, to the machine where uh, the, fir the first client was. And um, we actually had to go through like security reviews and performance reviews with Google. So we had to prove that this like you know example is actually valid and it doesn't like you know contradict the idea of load balancing. So it's actually you know super correct. So basically, you just don't load balance on like a single client client level, but you load balance on uh, like you know the level of two clients. But like you know the result is pretty much the same. Um, so so that was the solution and then you have like you know both clients on the same machine and they can talk to each other um and um just kind of like you know mentioning super briefly what other um what other um problems you can encounter when you work on uh like you know cloud solutions um web sockets and uh like multiplayer games is um, for example auto scaling down so um when you have the cloud um it scales right so based on the load you've got new machines coming up, you've got like, you know, some machines being shut down. 
And um, again, because we wanted to use everything like you know built in and uh, not have to write too much custom code, uh, which would have to be tested. And like you know, it's it's quite difficult to test it with like you know uh, multiple connections. So auto scaling down is the problem where a machine gets shut down because the load is quite low. Um, but you can still have connections ongoing on that very machine. So then, if this happens, and this happens like you know we don't know when it does actually, um, it's controlled completely by uh, the cloud system. Uh, then the connections would be shut down. So um, the way we figured out like how we fixed this was um, it actually was possible to execute a bit of code on each machine uh, 20 seconds before the machine is shut down. So um, we were sending messages to all the clients connected uh, on those machines. Hey, you know, this server is actually going to shut down in approximately 20 seconds, so do something with it. And um, what the clients were doing, they were actually like establishing a parallel WebSocket connection. So doing the whole process of like, you know, pairing, but they already knew the connection codes, they already knew all this stuff. So they would actually ask for a new server um, and a new WebSocket connection. So at some point, they would actually run two parallel WebSocket connections. So when the first one gets dropped, they already have the second one established. Um, so that was, that was the solution for this, and it actually worked um, pretty well. Um, and um, so that brings us to performance optimization. Um, some of this I already mentioned, so I'll just uh, like, you know, quickly go through this. But um, so you know the profilers, uh, like you know Unity has um, a really great one. Uh, on the web, you have something which is like you know kind of a web profiler. So it's definitely not as advanced as you have in Unity, but it still gives you um, the information you need. Um, so. As I mentioned, we had to go through performance reviews. So we had, like, you know, guys from uh, Google um, and, like, also our engineers uh, uh, looking into the code, like, you know, checking if you have, for example, what looks like even, you know, by just a single glimpse, um, as pretty much the same piece of code being executed like multiple times before the next animation frame. So we knew something was wrong there, um, and uh, actually that was some. Um, um, kind of, you know, consequence of using Polymer in this case. Uh, but yeah, we, we managed to figure this out. So that was a big part of this project as well, performance optimization. Um, physics, which I already mentioned, so the simplified uh, collision model. Um, and um, another thing which is related to backend um, in a bit more detail is um, Basically, you know, you, you send loads of data uh, between the devices, or like you actually maybe it's not loads of data, but it's just like you do it super frequently. So um, modern gyroscopes on the phones they refresh like on average 20 times per second, but like some of them refresh actually 60 times per second. Um, so it means you know if the network allows for it, we could send like you know 60 messages between the devices um, every single second. So it was essential to keep the payload uh, of each message like you know as minimal as possible. But it, it appeared that even like the WebSocket implementations that we found, um, when you use uh, like you know JSON um, kind of you know communication protocol or like even if you just work with basic strings, uh, the payload is quite big. So um, we implemented a, a custom binary communication protocol. Um, so like you know, it was sup super simplified. And uh, if you have like a single use case, you don't have to worry about like you know the other client knowing what data is being sent because we just sent this data. So uh, we could actually define something which was super simple, and um, it had uh, the payload uh, you know times smaller than um, if we used JSON or um, strings. Um, and um, Another thing from uh, performance optimization, um, which is also uh, quite interesting for people who are um, like you know planning to do um, like multiplayer games and uh, potentially running this on some custom uh, backend, is that. Um, for, like our first approach seems to be logical to us, but it appeared to be wrong as you know some things uh, that you actually have to just try out. So we decided to have in the beginning like you know loads of machines spread you know uh, across the cloud, and uh, each machine would run a single Node.js WebSocket server. And uh, like when we did load testing, it actually appeared that we have used all the allowance for uh, like you know the number of um, virtual machines but the performance was like we were actually expecting you know more people to be able to use it than we could allow at this point so we started thinking about how we could improve the performance further like you know code optimization was not really um, valid anymore because uh, the server was like really optimized um, 
also like there was not so much code. Um, but it appeared that it's much more efficient to um, run multiple Node.js or like basically multiple threads on a single machine and uh, instead of using many machines just like use more like powerful machines that can run multiple threads and uh, we basically ended up with a solution where uh, the Node.js server was like rewritten to be 32 threaded because basically 32 CPUs is the maximum you can get on virtual machines on a uh, Google Compute Engine and uh, then we uh, we're able to only have 260 um, like instances of the virtual machine, uh, which gave us like you know around 8,000 cores uh, running the WebSocket servers, like 8,000 instances. That's actually quite a lot if you think that like you know one instance can handle between like 500 to 1,000 people simultaneously, uh, like. Th with ease, so that basically gives us like four to eight million people being able to play the game uh, simultaneously. Um, so that was that was actually pretty cool. And um, f like you know, at the end of my presentation, just something to share with you. So uh, like people were doing crazy stuff with this project, and we didn't even know it's going to go so viral. So. Um, Basically, you know, all the effort that we've done through those, like, you know, three months production, they um, appeared super, super beneficial and rewarding at the end. Uh, so, uh, just, you know, a video for fun. Yo, Star Wars 第七集又上啦，作為一個星戰迷，有新 game 嘅推介俾大家，動人都亂啲啦，係咪？好，快啲冇啊，即係講下。嗱，冇錯，呢度就係我工作室啦。咁平時，睇我紅心望望，見到呢一個白洞 ，Light Saber。斜檔，然之後後面咧就出咗啲英，咁跟跟住咧就撳高，係啦，同你而家呢個 mon 可以去校正㗎啦，然之後撳啟動，咁啊，誒，連到咯喎，完成啦，哇正，你見到我隻手咧喐咧，佢又跟住，誒，我開個全形先，全形冇正啲啦，可以用曬三個 mon 都準嘅，喂，開埋個喇叭聲，手機聲先，哇正啊！哇，挡！暂停先，咁样玩边度好玩噶？要投入啊嘛，我张胶纸。哇，嗱，黐住我自己嘅 light saber。哇，咁就完美啦！戴翻个头盔先。嗱，咁樣玩呢就正啦！我哋開始，繼續。喂，點樣玩嘅？喂，擋啊！偷襲我！自打碌你！喂，好，可以死咗，終於可以斬死咗佢啦！咪終於反射射死咗佢啦！擋！呼！喂，唔得嘅，原來佢冇原力嘅。得把剑嘅咋？喂，搞掂！喂，偷袭我！你照紧镜噶嘛？开门！好多人啊！屎忽鬼出嚟！挡！出嚟！嘿，搞掂！傻仔嚟嘅！我呢个咩嚟噶？大佬，大佬啊呢个！我咩嚟嘅？系呢个？有冇过嚟啊你？走！呼、哦！走！哎呀，我咗个 mon 度！喂！喂，冇事！喂，死啦！我斩佢啦！出晒汗啦！喂，死未啊佢？我等咗个 mon 度，好似，哎，哇！我真系连 mon 打爆，终于斩死咗个白冰傻仔，我哋逃脱成功，终于玩完啦。But yeah, so besides fun, um, also I think this video is a good example of、uh, the precision of control that we managed to reach with this experience, and、uh, that actually brings me to the end of my presentation. But、um, I. I think we do have like three minutes for questions, so let me know if there is anything that interested you, and、uh, I'll be happy to answer.
I have a question about the cloud computing. When you said uh, one of the machines is going to shut down and you synchronize with another machine, that the pair of clients uh, have a connection through WebSockets with machine one and machine two, uh, then you have the cal calculation going on both of the machines at the same time. So I want to ask, ask about the synchronization because what if for the same input of the one of the uh, clients, you have different calculation results on the machines. Do you have a priority for uh, one of the machines or how is it done? So um, just to make sure because I think maybe um, one thing was uh, like you know either I explained differently, but basically both clients, so both the both the phone and um, and the computer were connected to the very same um, virtual machine on Google Cloud, so they were connected to just like one machine, not to like two different machines. Um, so I'm not sure if that was exactly like you know how you um, understood the setup, but basically like you know it, it was enough for us like one once uh, the virtual machine running the Node.js WebSocket server was shutting down both the clients which were running were connected to this specific machine. So they were like, you know, it, it is a bit of uh, like, you know, uh, there, there was a bit of a guess, like, you know, whether it's going to work or not, but like 20 seconds between when we know that the machine is going to shut down and like when it actually happens was just by experience uh, more than enough time to like send messages to both of the clients, so both to the desktop computer and to the mobile phone that the server is shutting down and then they would both uh, like you know establish a connection through um, like you know via a, a new WebSocket server. But let me know if it answers your question because what I understood from your question is you were asking you know if they are connected to two different machines but they were actually connected to, to the same machine. Yeah, yeah, you, you answered my question. Cool. Uh, hi, I have a question about uh, your um, custom uh, approach to position tracking of the uh, handset. So you said uh, you developed uh, a cu custom approach. Uh, what can you uh, tell us uh, about it? And did you uh, share it uh, with it somewhere on the web or did it stay in house? So it, it stayed in house to start from uh, like, you know, this part, uh, but actually like, you know, JavaScript is open source, so uh, it's it's not because we wanted to protect it in any way. Like you know, if people want, they can just like you know dig in the code and 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 get to it. Uh, but yeah, I might think about releasing it somewhere. So uh, that's a good point. In terms of how it actually worked, um, so the idea was that. Um, when you when you estimate the positions, like you know, if you know the orientation, you know the acceleration, you know the time which elapsed, you in theory can estimate the position. But the problem is the big error, which is accumulating. So the idea was like you know super simple, but as you saw in the video, it actually proved to work pretty well. So um, the end position, the result was like every single frame, it was like dampened, so it was multiplied by like, you know, 0 0.95, like, you know, just to give you um, an idea. So basically, if you, if you like, you know, make a quick move, uh, the dampening is not high enough to, to dampen that move. So you can see the result, but like if you hold the phone in that specific position, you would see that like 3D representation of the phone, like, you know, shifting to the center back again, because the position was like, you know, just dampened. So this, helped us remove the like you know precision error um, with fast motion and that was you know working really well but as I mentioned you know the, the downside of this was that you couldn't hold the lightsaber like up for example because it will it, it would always just go down so that's more or less the idea quite simple but uh, it worked <laughs> thank you we still have some time so if you have any more questions feel free Hi. So you mentioned a few times that you are inspired by Unity, and uh, why did you not use Unity for it? Because uh, in three months, that's a really fast development. Uh, you would have a lot of features that you had to do anyway. Yeah, that's true. Um, to be honest, uh, you know, the decision to to not use Unity was like super subjective. Uh, it's uh, basically like you know, if you if you develop a project for Google, I guess like you know, we didn't ask, uh, but I 
guests, you know, they have like, you know, FreeJS, they've got like all the browser kind of environment. So uh, we just had the impression that uh, potentially like a custom solution with FreeJS and, uh, and like, you know, WebGL would be uh, more welcome. So that was uh, one of the ideas. Um, the other thing was um, like, you know, we, we didn't try the Unity export uh, to WebGL for quite some time. Uh, so we just didn't have the experience to tell whether like, you know, it's like flawless, whether it's going to work or not. So it, and it was just like, you know, slightly too late for us to experiment with it and like, you know, go back into like other solution if, if it proved not to work. I think it's pretty fine right now, actually. Um, but yes, that was that was the main um, that was the main um, reason. And uh, the third reason, uh, which hopefully proved not to be the case, is that um, when, when we started developing the project, we still didn't know how the controller is going to work and like whether there is going to be any 3D um, environment on the phone as well. And um, Unity WebGL export doesn't work on uh, mobile phones right now. It's only like desktop only. So we just thought, okay, like you know, let's do it custom. We will spend you know a bit more time. But in the end, if we have to port it to the mobile phone, and actually at some point we considered um, having the game running on on tablets. So you would use your tablet as the primary screen and the mobile phone as the controller. Then then we would not be able to achieve this with uh, with Unity, at least you know, um, to the best of my knowledge. But um, yeah, otherwise I agree. Like you know, it also it gives you so many tools that we had to develop from scratch that uh, it would save some time, you know, with the other aspects. Okay, thank you. I have one more question. So basically, when you uh, from mathematical point of view, when you reflect the the, the shot from the trooper. It is very hard to hit him back. So, did you have any bonuses for the players to hit it back? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a very good question, and uh, it's uh, it's a pity I didn't include this as part of the presentation. Actually, um, so we we were discussing this for a long time. Like, you know, the client was like super focused on having this like you know physically correct, and uh, like you know our feedback was basically well laser shots are not physically correct anyways that you see in the movie so it's going to be difficult to make it work and also like given the amount of latency you have like if you have a shot which goes like you know in real time and like you have to precisely deflect it like no one is going to make it so we had to cheat it somehow so um, the couple of things we did is like first of all the collider um, which was like attached to the lightsaber was much bigger than the lightsaber itself um, so like you know shots which were like you know coming kind of you know slightly off your lightsaber were also deflected and then um, the deflection itself to not be frustrating like well maybe if you have like you know 15 stormtroopers standing in front of you there is a bit of chance that you will deflect towards one of them uh, if we do it like physically correct um, but if you have like one guy standing it would be almost impossible so our algorithm was um, slightly different actually so um, we were like randomly choosing a deflection target so like there was a certain percentage of chance that uh, like one of the targets will actually be the stormtrooper, and uh, that laser would be just like you know deflected towards that uh, stormtrooper with again like you know a bit of random um, inaccuracy. So like you know some shots would would like go towards a guy, but they would like miss him slightly, and uh, some would go directly to to some stormtroopers. Um, so it was not physically correct, but again like you know we <laughs> we had many discussions, and uh, it's like I guess easy to imagine that if you have a laser shot which is like you know quite narrow, you've got your um, lightsaber which is super narrow as well. Well, and it's round, like in real life, like a millimeter, millimeter uh, kind of, you know, difference in position would already result in like, I don't know, like 20 degrees difference of, of the deflection. Um, so it would be like completely impossible to, to have it accurate. So yeah, it was a bit of cheating, but um, it was like, you know, cheating for better gameplay and uh, more fun gameplay rather than like, you know, competition. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Cool. I guess if that's everything, thanks so much for your uh, attention. And uh, feel free to reach out. So you've got my, you don't have them anymore, but uh, Maciej at unit9.com. Um, thanks so much again. Thank you very much, Mr. Maciej Zasada.